Well, good morning and happy Mother's Day to those who are joining us on live stream. It is always good to be together. And I trust that you have your Bibles handy and ready because, after all, the Bible is God's love letter to us. And would you turn, please, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, a fairly familiar passage to many of us. Proverbs chapter 31, we're going to be looking at verses 10 to 11 and then 25 to 31. And if you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 948. And so once again, as we honor God and his word as you are able, would you stand as Gilly comes to read? Proverbs chapter 31. Those stuff's getting long. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can get the right verses. Proverbs 31, starting 10 11. <clears throat> a wife of noble character who can, who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. Then down to 25. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household, does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned, and let her works bring her praise at the city gates. We praise God this morning for mothers, and we know that God is a God of relationship, and one of the best examples of a beautiful relationship, in fact, probably the best example, is that of a mother uh, with her child. And so this morning, we want to praise God for giving us those relationships. Let's worship his name. Thank you. 
good to be part of the family.
just a sample of that amazing love through our mothers. And we're so grateful for them and forever grateful for you. Again, Lord, we ask that everything we do and say, even everything we think this morning, would be a sweet-smelling offering to you. Would you take our offerings and our tithes and our prayers and our testimonies and our voices and our service, would you use it to be glorified and may more people hear of you through it. To God be the glory. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one day God said to Adam, it's not good for you to be alone. You need help. So God says, what if I make the perfect woman for you? She's going to be absolutely knockout gorgeous. She'll be the perfect wife, the perfect cook, the perfect mother. She's going to serve you and please you in every way without complaining. She's going to be the perfect woman. And Adam said, wow, that sounds great. But uh, that sounds pretty expensive. What's all that going to cost me? And God said, well, the perfect woman is expensive. It's going to cost you an arm and a leg. So Adam thought for a moment and he asked, so what can I get for a rib? I know, I'm limited in my jokes, okay? You know. <clears throat> well, happy Mother's Day to all of the, our mothers, even those that are less than perfect. And we want to say that we appreciate you so much. Now, it would be fitting for us on Mother's Day, since we're studying the book of Proverbs, to look at chapter 31 of Proverbs that we read earlier. But we looked at that a couple weeks ago. So today for Mother's Day, I want to start back at the beginning so would you turn, please, to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, as we take a look at the very first mother. Her name is Eve. Now, Eve is actually not mentioned a whole lot 
in Scripture. But there is a whole lot more about her than just that forbidden fruit incident. And I can uh, tell you that there's something here for every one of us as well. So before we open the Word of God, let's open our hearts and pray. Father, we are indeed blessed to be in your holy presence. And I pray that our hearts are pure before you, that there is no sin in this camp, that we have confessed our sins and our shortcomings, that we stand before you holy and pure so that we can hear from you. And that's what we need to do, Lord. We all need to hear from you. So would you speak again through your spirit? You know what every heart needs to hear today. So would you speak and may we hear, and may we put into practice what you have for us. Again, Lord, we pray, speak for your servants, your children are listening. And we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Now, Genesis chapter 3, verse 20 says that Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all living. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, the name Eve means living. So she's the very first mother of all living human beings. By the way, to, to name someone or to name something implies your authority over them, your responsibility for them. For example, Adam named all the animals to demonstrate his authority over them. But I want to point out seven truths about Eve this morning that I believe are relevant to, to pretty much every woman here today. <clears throat> seven truths about Eve. The first truth is she was needed. She was needed. Because we need women today. Can I get an amen? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Look at Genesis 2, verse 18. Genesis 2, verse 18, <clears throat> says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. It's not good for the, woman, for the man to be alone. She was needed. An English professor <clears throat> wrote this sentence on the blackboard. Woman without her man is nothing. And he told his students to punctuate that sentence correctly. So the men wrote, woman, comma, without her man, comma, is nothing. But the women wrote, woman, exclamation point, without her comma, man is nothing. Ah. See, there's truth to both answers. We need each other. We do. So Eve, first of all, was needed. Secondly, we see that she was a helper. She was a helper, a help meet. She was created to be a helper to Adam because everyone knows that man needs help, right? We do. God says, I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, as we've been <clears throat> worshiping this morning, we were reminded that God is a God of relationships. He, he exists in this perfect relationship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he created mankind to have a relationship with him. But more than that, God realized that mankind also needs relationships with one another. The challenge, though, is getting Adam to realize he needed that relationship. Because men can be kind of dense in that sort of thing, can't we? So how does God get Adam to realize his need? Well, he has him name the animals. So Adam is naming all these animals, and he's seeing pairs and mates with every animal. <clears throat> but it says in verse 20, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. He gets to the end of listing all the animals, and he's like, wait a minute, <clears throat> where's mine? So verse 21, the Lord God 
caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs or portion of his side and closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of man, and he brought her to the man. Which is the third truth we see about Eve, is that she was handcrafted. She was handcrafted. That's what the word made really means. <clears throat> he built her with precision. God didn't just create her from the dirt like he did Adam. No, she was special. She was Adam's helpmeet, his side-by-side -side companion. Jack Taylor once said, When God made man, he made a rather simple thing. But when God made woman, he handcrafted her. Matthew Henry, in his commentary, writes this. The woman <clears throat> was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, <coughs> Excuse me. but out of his side to be equal with him, <coughs> under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. Isn't that beautiful? So Eve was... In every respect, Adam's side-by-side -side partner. <clears throat> she was a helper. So we have now the, the very first wedding ceremony, <clears throat> and God gets to lead the bride down the aisle. She was made from him and for him and then brought to him. And when Adam saw his bride turn that corner and come down the aisle, the first thing Adam said was, whoa, man. <laughs> Hence the name. <clears throat> I know it's not getting any better, is it? Actually, what, verse, what Adam says is in verse 23, he says, now this is now bone of my bones, Flesh of my flesh, she's part of me. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That's what the word woman means. People say, how do you define a woman? Well, woman literally means out of man. Isn't it ironic today that man comes out of woman? Imagine that. So she is a helper a partner, she's handcrafted. And then the fourth truth we see about Eve is that she was one with her husband. She was one with her husband, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Verse 24 says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Now, marriage was instituted by God because he knew that we need each other. That's the reason. We need each other. You see, the primary purpose for marriage is not love or sex or procreation or convenience. Marriage fulfills a basic human need for companionship, relationship, partnership. We need each other. That's the foundation for marriage. In fact, in verse 24, God gives three requirements that each partner needs to live out in marriage. Three requirements that each partner needs to live out in a marriage. There is leaving, cleaving, and weaving. Leaving, cleaving, and weaving. Now, leaving literally means to, to lose or forsake. It, it really means to cut the apron springs. The apron strings. It means we change our priorities from that of our former family to that of our new family. Our new family, our new partner becomes our priority. That's what it means to leave. Cleaving means we are united to our spouse. We, we become, uh, we cling to, we keep close. 
It's like gluing two pieces of paper together. They become inseparable. That's the idea of cleaving. It, <clears throat> it also means that we accept each other for better or for worse. Warts and all, right? We accept each other. That's what it means to cleave. So God takes two completely different people. He takes a man and a woman, and he unites them together into a whole new being. So not only are they to leave their former family and cleave to each other, they're to weave their lives together. That's the idea of becoming one flesh. Again, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Weaving is, or marriage is a weaving of two individuals to create a new entity, a new oneness. You could say that marriage is when two independents become interdependent. That's what marriage is about. And Eve was one with her husband. <clears throat> And verse 25 says, the man and his wife were both naked and felt no shame because they were perfectly united. There was no guilt or shame. Now, these are the positive truths about Eve. Let's take a look now at some of the less than positive truths. <clears throat> the fifth thing we want to see is that she was also deceived. Eve was deceived. Notice that the first thing Satan does in chapter 3 is that he casts doubt on God's goodness. He casts doubt on God's goodness. Look at chapter 3. Verse 3, Satan says, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Notice right off the bat he lied to her. Because he knew that God didn't say you couldn't eat from any tree. See, he's, he's taken advantage of her innocence. He's playing her. And so Eve explains what God said. Oh, no, 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 no. We can eat any tree, just not this one. But notice she adds, oh, but we can't touch it either. Now, God didn't say that, but it probably was a good advice. Don't go near it. Flee temptation, right? And look what Satan says in verse 4. He says, you will not certainly die. There's another lie. The serpent said in verse 5, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, they didn't know evil up to that point. But let's face it, who wouldn't want to be like God, knowing everything? Huh? That sounds pretty enticing. Mind you, <clears throat> Eve still has a choice. She knew the rule. She had a choice. She had free will if she was going to obey or not. And, of course, we know what she did. Verse 6, <coughs> excuse me. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she gave some to her husband, catch this, who was with her, and he ate it. See, Adam is just as guilty. He's just as guilty. In fact, Romans 5.12 says it was Adam who sinned. Remember, he was responsible for her. He stood right there and let it happen. And then he joined her. And then verse 7, the one truth that Satan did say, verse 7, the eyes of both of them were opened. He said, your eyes will be opened. Oh, yeah. They were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, I would not recommend you try to sew fig leaves together for any particular purpose, <clears throat> okay? They tried, because now all of a sudden they have shame. See, the first result of sin is that shame and that guilt. Oh, no. 
And then they got busted. God comes looking for them because, again, God is a God of relationship. He comes looking for them, and what do they do? They try to hide. They try to hide because they knew they were guilty. Well, here's a news flash, folks. You cannot hide from God. Not going to happen. And God tells them in verse 11, Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Now, God already knew what they had done. It already broke his heart. But he's giving Adam a chance to own up to it. He's giving Adam a chance to confess. And so what is Adam's first reaction here? What's his first response after he got busted? He blames Eve. Yep. Verse 12, he says, The woman you put here with me, do you see almost the, the implication? God, you did it. You put her here. The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And then what does Eve do? <laughs> serpent told me. She blames the serpent. It, isn't it quite often our first reaction when we're convicted of our sin, when we're caught in a sin, what's the first knee-jerk reaction? Blame someone. Blame someone else. Their sin has now broken their perfect relationship with Almighty God. And because of their sin, all creation now is cursed. It's cursed. <clears throat> this cold is part of that curse. Look, but look at chapter 3, verse 15. This is a key, key verse. You should circle this in your Bibles if you haven't already. The Lord is speaking to Satan and he says, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, between your offspring, your seed, and hers. He will crush your head. That's fatal. And you will strike his heel. So the seed of the woman is going to crush the power of sin. But in the process, it will come at a cost. By the way, this is the gospel, folks. The gospel of Jesus Christ is found in Genesis 3.15. Because Eve's eventual seed, her eventual offspring, will be none other than God's own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he comes, he will crush the power of Satan, the power of sin. Amen? Amen? And there's coming a day when he will crush sin once and for all. So not only was Eve deceived, and, and yet she deliberately chose to sin, the sixth truth we see about her is that because of that, she was cursed. She was cursed because sin always always has consequences. Sin always brings a curse. When they ate that fruit, they died spiritually right then because death implies separation. They were separated from Almighty God. They tried to hide from him. And then they also began to die physically. But you know, there were even more consequences of their sin. Look at verse 16 of chapter 3. <clears throat> to the woman, God said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. And every mother here knows exactly what that feels like. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, that last sentence sounds kind of beautiful, doesn't it? Oh, your desire will be for your husband. No, it's actually just the opposite. Remember, this is part of the curse. The desire he's speaking about here is a desire to rule over and control. In fact, he uses the same word in Genesis 4 when he says to Cain, sin desires to have you and control you. 
So what we see here is that now because of the curse, there's going to be a power struggle within every marriage. And marriage is frequently that power struggle, isn't it? Both sides want to be in charge. Both sides want to control. You can thank the curse for that. Not only that, but Adam and Eve now have to go and work a cursed earth and struggle for their food every day until they died. And we see that in verse 19. All of these are terrible curses because of their sin. But I believe the greatest curse of all is found down in verse 23. Look at verse 23. It says, So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden. God banished Adam and Eve from his presence. They were separated from God because of their sin, because of our sin. We are now cursed and therefore separated from a loving God. And the only way that they could break that curse, the only way that we can break that curse is through the seed of, of the woman, the seed of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only way that we can break that curse and be reconciled to God. And then we, we, we end these truths on a more positive note because we also see in chapter 4 that she was hopeful. <clears throat> She was hopeful. See, even in Eve's guilt and sin, she clung to the promise of God. That promise in Genesis 3.15 that God is still going to restore things even though mankind messed it up. Chapter 4, verse 1 says that Adam lay with his wife Eve. She became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said... With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. What she's actually saying here is, I have brought forth the man, the seed who's going to crush Satan. See, she thought that Cain was going to be the Messiah. He was going to deliver them from sin. That didn't happen, did it? In fact, and then verse 2, later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, the truth is, Eve actually had many, many more sons and daughters. In fact, she likely lived about 900 years before she died. You can have a lot of children in 900 years. <clears throat> now, it's interesting, though, that the only other times that we see Eve mentioned is Genesis 4.25, where she gives birth to a son named Seth, and Seth actually becomes the line uh, for the Messiah. And then also in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 15, where Paul is teaching women to submit to, to uh, men, to submit to their husbands, because, he says, Eve sinned first. So it's possible then that submission to men and the struggle for control is also part of her curse. But, but Eve is hopeful. She's hopeful that things are going to turn around eventually. Okay, so taking a look at Eve then, what are some lessons that we can learn from this? What are some lessons? Because again, this message is for men and women alike. All of God's word is inspired. We can all learn something from this. Let me share with you three lessons I think we can take from this. First of all, we are created for relationship. We're created for relationship. It is not good for man to be alone. We were created to have a personal, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a personal and beautiful relationship with our creator and with each other. We're created for relationship. Folks, that's an incredible blessing. We need to take full advantage of that blessing. We can have a relationship with God. And yet, and yet we cannot have 
a beautiful relationship with anyone apart from Jesus Christ, who is our cure. Okay? We cannot have a beautiful relationship without Jesus. Jesus says himself in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one, no one comes to the Father, no one can have a relationship with God except through me. Now think about this for a moment. God created us to be with him forever. He created us to have a relationship with him where we can walk with him and talk with him. In fact, he, he so desires a relationship with us that it cost him his son's life. He sent his own son down to this wicked earth to die on a horrible cross in order to crush sin and break the curse so that we can have a relationship with him. We're created for relationship. We need to take advantage of that. I think a second lesson we can learn <clears throat> is that we must be content in Christ alone. We need to be content in Christ alone. Listen, the reason that Adam and Eve sinned is because they were not content with what God had given them. They thought they were missing out. They wanted to be like God. And they paid dearly for that discontent. You know, many couples today are not content. They feel like they're missing something. They, they want more. They deserve more. And so they're not content. Listen, you will never find true contentment and unity and oneness in your relationship apart from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. You will never find true contentment and unity in your relationship apart from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He's the one that makes it all happen. So we were created for relationship. And we need to be content in Christ alone. Christ is our joy, not our spouse. We can't be leaning on our spouse to fulfill our, our joy and our basic needs because that is what God gives. So we need to be content in Christ alone. And then thirdly, we must acknowledge our sin. We must acknowledge our sin. We need to own our sin when we, when we commit sin. When we mess up, we need to fess up. See, Adam and Eve tried the blame game, didn't they? Not my fault. Isn't it funny how it's always someone else's fault? No, it's not. It's our own fault. And we need to come clean with that. We need to own it. We can't blame Adam and Eve or our parents or anyone else for our own sin. We need to own it. We need to confess it. More than that, we need to repent. We need to repent. In fact, we will never have that beautiful relationship with God until we renounce sin, until we repent and break the curse. So we need to acknowledge and repent of our sin. Allow me to summarize this and give you the bottom line. And I think this is the, what Eve's story teaches us. Sin destroys, but Jesus restores. Sin destroys, but Jesus restores. He restores that relationship that we all desperately need, the relationship we were created for. Listen, Eve was not the perfect mother. Even the very first mother wasn't perfect. And there's no such thing as a perfect mother. But you know, we can learn so much from her life. So let me ask you this. Has Jesus restored your relationship with God? Has your relationship with Jesus strengthened your relationship with each other? 
And is your hope in Christ alone? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I can't thank you enough for this incredible truth, this incredible revelation that you love us, that you created us to have a relationship with you. And we are forever grateful for that. God, I thank you so much that we can know you. And, and I thank you that in our human relationships, and especially the relationships in a marriage, that they can imitate our relationship with you. And so I pray that you would strengthen marriages today. More than that, that you would strengthen relationships with you. And Lord, again, I pray for those who may be here or may be watching online and they have to admit that they don't have that relationship with you that they need. Maybe they have not yet owned their sin. They've not yet been broken over it and confessed it. And Lord, if that's true, you know who they are. Would you grab hold of their heart right now? Would you convict them, please, by your spirit? That here and now they would repent. They would cry out to you and say, God, I, I own my sin I, I have sinned against you. I deserve your wrath. I deserve to be separated from you. But I'm begging you by the blood of Jesus to forgive me, to save me, to restore that relationship that I desperately need to have with you. Lord, would you continue to be about the business of creating and restoring relationships? And may we continue to seek you and find strength and hope and joy in none other than Christ alone. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for our mothers. Thank you for the women in our lives. Thank you for being the perfect example of a perfect relationship. We love you too. We pray in Jesus' name. <clears throat> we say if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ then you are missing out on the most perfect relationship of all in Christ alone our hope is found he is our light, our strength, our song he is our all in all Let's review our relationship with him as we stand and see this last time.
Father, give us the strength to stand in your presence, to enjoy that beautiful relationship that we can have because of Jesus Christ. May we take full advantage of that relationship. May it grow stronger and stronger in you. May you be our all in all, our strength, our support, our hope. God, thank you. Thank you for relationships. Thank you that we can know you and have a relationship with you. And we long for that day when this bride will be united with her bridegroom. And we will be together forever. Until then, may we be faithful and love you back in Jesus' name. Amen. Now go and make more disciples who will also enjoy that relationship with him. Thank you.